Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host Justine Espiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Hi. Every other Thursday we bring on farmers and other representatives, organizations, individuals that are a part of our local food system. That includes nonprofits, that includes uh, city or um, departmental representations, different groups that are acting as resources for farmers and helping to create a community around food and make it a better place. So who do we have on today? Um, yeah, before we even get to that, I'm just going to let everybody re remind them that they can join the conversation by tweeting in at, at ThinkTechHI. And you can even call in by calling the hotline number at 415-871-2474. So yeah, so today we have a couple of great guests, some good longtime friends of mine uh, from the Hawaii Ag Research Center. So with us today we have the Executive Director, Stevie Whalen, and we also have the Kunia Farm Station Manager, uh, Jamie Barton. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Thank you guys. Yeah, so uh, just like Justine was saying, the uh, purpose of the show is bringing on um, you know, farmers and foodies and people who are really just working hard to make Hawaii's local food system that much better. And HARC is probably one of the, I guess, longer organizations that's been around uh, so long that it's actually changed its name from Hawaii <laughs> Sugar <laughs> Plantation <laughs> Association. Yeah. Um, but also, Stevie, it's great having you on the show. You've been doing so many different things, uh, helping a local ag from the sugar industry days and now to the more diversified ag days. So we're real excited to uh, hear from the both of you on um, all the work you guys are doing. Okay. Um, so why don't we start off with Stevie, if you can just do a brief introduction of yourself and then also a uh, background on HARC. Okay. Well, I can combine the two of them and I've been in the industry for a, a long time. Actually, I came to the islands in 66, was a science teacher for one year and then um, because I had the kids bring in frogs and they dropped them and they went to the principal's office. So I, you know, they didn't ask me. That was, that was enough of that. <laughs> really, I, I gotta get out. Okay. Of that. Your time's up. <laughs> Take your frogs with you. <laughs> right, right. So and then I worked for a community pesticide analytical laboratory, one of 29 around the nation, for a few years, and then I was hired by the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association, which is an organization started in 1882. Oh wow! Changed its name. Um, and to the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association in 1895 when they created a research entity. Okay. okay. And went on for many years in crop improvement and stuff, mainly focusing on sugar, but not just sugar, because we were working for the big five who mm -hmm. were looking at some kind of replacement crop. So we were involved in lots of stuff. Um, and then moving on, big gap. Um, in 2006, we changed the name to Hawaii Agriculture Research Center because um, just because we wanted the public to have a better idea that mm -hmm. we were just not solely sugar and we were involved in a lot of stuff throughout the decades. Yeah. It just didn't associate with that. And then um, in 2009, I believe it was, we um, actually we're no longer a trade association, mm. okay, because mm -hmm. it was sponsored just by the sugar companies and actually paid for by the sugar companies. Mm -hmm. We then um, only had one company left mm -hmm. because GNR was uh, one of two, HCNS and GNR, and when GNR went out, well, you can't have a trade association. What was one G company. GNR again? Gay and Robinson, okay. the last sugar operation on Kauai. Okay. Okay. So you can't have a trade association for a a single, a single organization. Entity. Yeah, yeah. So we Not became, much trading going on. <laughs> right. Or associating. <laughs> so that's what we changed. They're actually pretty dramatically in what our mission was in a way. Mm -hmm. Because before as a trade association you you know, you're part of the political scene and all the rest of it for your commodity, but you know, now we're strictly like a church or a university, we're five oh one C three um, charitable organization, only scientific organization. So that was the change. I became the director in 1994 okay. and have been there ever since to this transition. So we're transitioning from sugar, mm -hmm. large scale, to smaller scale, and you know, it's, it's and from a trade association totally sponsored and paid for by an industry to one that's out there and everybody else competing for funds. Wow. Yeah. And just for a little clarification, who is a part of of the group? Is it uh, different farmers make okay. up the members? So our or? board. 
So before, when we were a trade association, totally the sugar operation, the big five were our board members. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we actually started, as they started downsizing, mm -hmm. we started changing the board, bringing on different uh, parties, the Farm Bureau, um, different commodity groups, uh, lawyers, you know, just like a, re and then, right. you know, ter totally turned it over from being operated or um, administered by the board uh, of all these sugar to a very diverse board, just like any other nonprofit. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that's an interesting transition. I can only imagine the challenges associated with it, especially, I mean, just changing the name three times and, mm -hmm. and changing along with the, the changing landscape of agriculture in Hawaii is, is super impressive. Um, but I also want to hear from Jamie, uh, <laughs> who is a little bit newer to the organization. Yes. Um, so you came on just a few, maybe four or five years ago? Yeah, so I've been, I've actually been at Hark for, it's like seven and a half years now. Oh, okay. It's gone by really <laughs> fast. Um, yeah, so my background is um, less interesting in terms of ag, ag topics, I guess. Um, I originally wasn't um, intending to work in agriculture. I thought I was going to go be a physical therapist. So I sort okay. of ended up in agriculture by accident. I guess just sort of a series of things that happened that kind of ended up with me being at Hark. Um, but originally, yeah. So I was I was going to school to be a physical therapist. I ended up doing a study abroad program, traveled around the world, and completely shifted careers and decided nice. not to move to Omaha, Nebraska anymore, and to move back to Hawaii. Good <laughs> so um, and then when I came back, I was going um, back to school again to get my master's degree in um, global leadership and sustainable development. And I ended up getting an internship at Hark, actually. Um, and it was through the Kupu AmeriCorps program. Okay. And so um, I started out, yes, yeah, 2009, and, mm -hmm. and have definitely found my passion. This is what I want to do. I never, never would have imagined myself working on a farm or working with farmers. I was definitely the generation that thought food came from the grocery store. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, this is definitely a, a huge um, life transition, but it's been, it's been really awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so so and and now you're the the farm manager. Yes. So so I guess Park has a few different locations. Mm, right. There's the Cunea location, and then I guess there's two Cunea locations. There's three, That's correct. Yeah. yeah, three locations now. So we have two locations um, in Cunea. There's our farm where I'm at the lower research site, or we call it Lower Cunea, but it's mm -hmm. right after you get off the freeway. And then if you go up to Upper Cunea, that's where Stevie's at and where we have some agricultural housing that I think she will probably talk a little bit about. And then we have another research station over in Manawili, okay. and they primarily work on um, forestry and sugarcane breeding work over there. Okay. And so, Jamie, give us a little background on the station that you manage, and what, what is that? look like? I mean, being an entire farm management, how many acres and, and what yeah. kind of things are you specifically doing? I'm doing a little bit of everything. So we're, we're a nonprofit, so we have many different hats. Um, we have a lot of different things that we do day to day. Um, but I, yeah, I manage the Cunea farm, which is about 108 acres. We farm a little over half of that. Um, and my job day to day is always different. There's never a dull moment. Um, so I'm constantly learning. Um, a variety of different types of projects um, from consulting on things like an ulu project that I did with yeah, you Matt yeah, yeah. Um, to working on local forage and local feed projects um, and breeding high biomass grasses all kinds of different things yeah so it, it sort of just depends on the day <laughs> depends on the year yeah, yeah. But everything you're going over there is, is for kind of research yes, projects. It's all research you're not growing based. anything commercially or um, well, not exactly. We sort of got into coffee and cacao production a little bit recently. Um, but prior to that, no, we were primarily just doing research projects. So we have on our farm I think five or six acres of coffee, about an acre of cacao. Um, we grow papaya, pineapple, um, pretty much anything someone wants us to do research on we can grow. So I've grown corn, I've grown rice, sugar beets. And so anything that anyone wants research on, is that like mm -hmm. UH extension agents? Is that um, different farm farmers that are reaching out to you or new farmers that want to start a project? <laughs> so they're like, yeah. hey, what, what do you know about this? And then they want to like copy your homework and start exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's all of that, actually. <laughs> it's all of that. So it really, it's what I've realized is in the past couple of years, um, it just depends on what people are interested in at the moment. So I 
came in working on biofuels specifically mm. because in 2009, 10, everyone was interested in trying to yeah. find different forms of renewable energy. So I was working on a few different um, oilseed tree crops, mm. one called Jotropha. Um, I've worked with some other tree crops as well, but then I ended up getting into um, high biomass grasses. So okay. that's a project I'm still actually working on. Um, we're breeding grasses that are, um, they're basically, you can use them for either high biomass or for animal feed. So if you cut them when they're short, they have a high protein content. They're really um, useful for animal feed. But then if you grow them for a year or so, um, they're just an incredible amount of biomass. And so yeah, that's one of the projects we're doing. And actually, the grasses are pretty interesting because they're, um, they're sterile, so they're non-invasive. Mm. Um, and then you would manage them as a perennial crop. So you have all the, I mean, added benefits of a perennial crop. So you're not tilling your soil, you're not ripping the crop out of the ground, you're just going in and repeatedly harvesting. So you're oh, sequestering nice. carbon, you're increasing your soil health. There's a lot of really awesome benefits to that, so. So I think that kind of gets a little bit into how do we fund ourselves now, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were totally dependent on the sugar industry before, so this was a, this was a real big transition. Yeah, so it's and a new so, business model for you. Yes, exactly, and, and yeah, we're scientists, we're not business people. Right, right, right. <laughs> so this has really been a transition but um, it is what is somebody willing to pay for mm -hmm. okay uh -huh. now we do have some funding and that comes back to the village which we can talk about a little yeah. bit later mm -hmm. but um, we really need to we're really committed to Hawaii's agriculture mm -hmm. you know we're not looking at exporting we're not looking at working for mainland companies necessarily and stuff but what is Hawaii need what, where can we help there that's our tradition that's what we've done and so that's what we try to focus on again. So everybody was interested in biofuel crops, like she mm -hmm. says, okay, we did that. We had a little bit of funding that we can put in ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, but really has to be funded from somebody who is interested, interested and enough in it. <laughs> and usually a business who wants to, to look at something. And so, um, you know, that that's really how we fund ourselves now. And um, it really needs, I mean, there's entrepreneurs out there who are interested and recognize that they need to do a little research before they just jump mm -hmm. into something, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So the main crops that we've been dealing with, and like she mentioned coffee, and um, we can talk about that a little bit later, and how, how we're starting to use our own crops to try and fund our own programs. That's great, yeah, it's right. a little different from the, the resources and, and folks that have come on. So we're gonna take a quick break and then mm -hmm. get into your specific example about that. Okay, all right, cool. Awesome. Thank you. I'm Jay Fidel, and with Ray Starling, I host Hawaii, the state of clean energy, 4 o'clock every Wednesday. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, making discovery of what's going on in energy in this community. Ray, what do you think? We've got a great group of shows coming up, uh, finishing out this year and starting next year. Uh, Dean Nishida has been with us today. Uh, he's the new consumer advocate, and uh, he has told us a lot, but he's got a lot more to tell. So we're going to have him back and others like him in future shows. And Dean, how much of that do you agree with? There's a lot to be said, and I'm interested in seeing some of your other shows. Okay, we'll be back 4 o'clock every Wednesday here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. <laughs> Aloha, and welcome back to White Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host, Matt, here with Justine, and we're going to jump right back into our conversation with Stevie Whalen and Jamie Barton from Hawaii Ag Research Center. And we're just having a heated discussion that we actually continued it over to the break, uh, but we want to have the rest of our viewers join in as well. So we're talking about this transition that uh, you went from a, a trade association into a 5163 nonprofit and changing your business model and saying you guys are, are scientists, you're doing ag research and figuring out how you uh, continue to do the work that you're doing and changing um, agricultural economy. Right. So if you jump right back in talking about how okay. you guys fund yourselves. Okay, so the traditional funding was a commodity group that recognized research was important mm -hmm. and therefore they funded it. And even though it's always high risk, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get rewards for every year. It took us, took us like 12 years to create a new product mm -hmm. for sugarcane. Okay, and that's through breeding techniques, okay? All right, so you gotta be patient. You're gonna wait for 12 years yeah. before you get a reward on your money. So when you have now the type of agriculture we have now, smaller groups, smaller 
smaller commodities, not necessarily real well organized, and they don't see they have a problem until the problem hits. Mm -hmm. By that time, it really is too late if it's a disease problem or a pest problem. Okay, fortunately, the coffee industry and this latest pest problem that they have, okay, there was that pest problem throughout the world, so they knew some how to, how to attack it. So the university and the group stepped in to help them. All right, but. So, but they're not going to be funding research, and we've been looking at um, uh, the coffee rust came up this past year yeah. about how that could devastate the entire Hawaii industry. There's no funding for it. We started it maybe 20 years ago, just our breeder on the side doing this, you know, because she knew it was important. Um, and so then all of a sudden it's a crisis, and said, well, we have some. We have some uh, potential new things. The rest not here yet, but we could send them off to other countries to get them tested. Because we're not going to bring the rest here and test them. We've got to send it off to another country where they have it, and they'll test it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but nobody's funding that. So we thought, how do we fund ourselves? So the commodity group's too small. They're not going to fund us. So we looked at landowners. That didn't work either. But um, what we did, well, we have a coffee product in our fields, and it's fallen on the ground. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Lots of uh, both, both at Mount Willie and at Kunia. And so maybe we should be harvesting that and selling it. Mm. So that's what we started. And we just started a few years ago. We're still, you know, entrepreneurs trying to figure this out mm. as scientists. And so that seems to be going pretty well. It looks like we have a very specific variety that Japan likes. Mm. They will pay like $40 to $100, for, you know, for this, depending on if it's just raw, you know, or roasted. And so... And we don't have very much of it, but we have buyers now. You know, so that's the way we look. Well, so you are exporting some. Yeah, well, we bit. haven't yet. We haven't yet, but we just at talked to that, that. How much do we have? You know, we've got the buyers interested and stuff, but and then how much will that bring in? How much does it cost us to do that? Uh -huh. And then how much will it bring in to help the coffee program? Mm. Now, can we do that same model for the cacao program? Right. And then bring in our own funds for, you know, the research that mm. goes on. Right. So, and then we partner... We partner with uh, various universities, There's the biofuel crops considerably, that's the University of Illinois, Texas A&M, to work together on that. Um, we partner with uh, US USDA and the cacao program. They can bring funding to us as we partner with them. And then the Department of Ag has funds that, so we could go for grants like that. So that's kind of what we're doing. And then private entrepreneurs who want us to look at something, mm -hmm. then we do that for a service fee. Mm -hmm. so. so I actually want to ask Jamie here. So with some of these, mm -hmm. these projects that Stevie is talking about, from the, because we kind of like identify like, okay, there's a problem here. But then at the farm management level, when and this is handed over to you saying, okay, we need you to do these trials or mm -hmm. do you, what are some specific examples or something that, what's it look like when, when it's given to you, what happens then? How do you do these, these trials or what are you doing? It depends on what it is. I mean, sometimes we're basically just identifying whatever the specific issue is that they have. Um, usually, I don't know what would be a good example of something like that. <laughs> um, so, okay, a, a good example would be um, we were working with a group that was interested in growing uh, high biomass sorghum for energy. Okay. Um, and so we would install a trial for them where we plant sorghum every month, we measure the yield, we collect the data, we report it to them, and then they say, okay, this variety is the one we want to work with. Or, you know, these are these are good candidates, these are not, you know. And a lot of that of is under... Um Mm -hmm. Confidentiality. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. right. So we can talk about it generally, but yeah. you know the, the data that's produced mm -hmm. goes specifically to them, and that's it. We don't get to yeah. do anything more with it. We probably do half a dozen projects like that a year, so it just depends on the the group and what it is they yeah. they want. So uh, like another thing we're doing right now, we're looking at animal feed. So mm -hmm. we're trying to produce more local animal feed rather than relying on imported this animal would be like feed. like for the cattle industry, for, might sure. be interested in something like goats, this as an example. Cattle, goats, goats chickens, chickens. Ev mm -hmm. everything pretty much. Yeah. And so agreed. we're running trials where we're just planting different species, different cultivars of different species in different environments, collecting data, reporting it to the funders, the farmers, whoever wants that information. Yeah. Um, so um, kind of changing topics, but also similar. So talking about the Kunia Eco Village, is that the, the oh, right, or the, okay, the, the farm worker housing? Because yeah. that's kind of a, I mean, it's under heart, but also it's kind of a separate Right. project that you've been working on for a while. You're talking a little yeah, bit about that? So back in about 2005 and six, when Campbell was selling all their ag land, mm. then they came to us and said, gee, we have a deal for you. Mm. <laughs> okay, and it, it was and it wasn't. You know, it's, um, they had the village that was very difficult to sell the property with uh, retirees on it and decrepitated housing and all the rest of it, and they wanted to get rid of the land. So, so they this is old out. farm worker 
housing. This is and Del Monte. Del Monte land. Del or not Del Monte land, but Del Monte was leasing the land. Then they right. went out of business. Right. And so the landowner had this this infrastructure and families living there and didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we wanted to get it out of their yeah. <laughs> responsibility. Yeah. So they came to us and said, yeah, we'll give it to you. You know, and there was some caveats associated with it, not that important. But so... And of course, my board thought I was absolutely crazy because <laughs> they have plantation housing. They know how difficult it is and right. keeping it up and the expectations of the people living there. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you come in and change the light bulbs for them. Come on. But that's the kind of expectation that the plantations produced through the years. They right. did everything for them, yeah. right? But anyway, so we ended up with another 100 acres, 119 acres up there. We had 121 units on it and about eight warehouses, a gym, wonderful gym. Um, some ch a chapel, you know, kind of a very small community, yeah, a some store. Good in that gym. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we're still having them. Uh, <laughs> She's not getting invited, I guess. <laughs> well, go live there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the the houses are eighty to hundred years old. Wow. And you know, so we have gotten the funds. It's very difficult, complicated, sort of low income housing, and to renovate eighty two of them. Well, renovate thirty. 42 and um, 45 and build brand new 37. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. That look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. However, it's an historic district and yada, yada, yada. So, so a lot of limitations of what you can do and cannot right, do. Right, right. And the people we were working on have been very helpful, realizing this is low-income housing. We can't put these things back exactly like they were. Mm. But we've kept most of them, especially the ones facing the road, exactly like they were from the outside. Mm. Inside, they allowed us totally change, making a modern house. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful on the inside. Plus, they added extra bathrooms. Rooms. So they have two bathrooms instead of just the one like they traditionally had. Took down a barrier wall and made it like a big open great room instead of compartmental of those small rooms. <laughs> So well, this has already been really, complete. This it's be completed in May. Some of the houses, the renovated ones, many of them are complete, and the new construction is still going on. But um, you know, we have big plans. We're going to build a uh, playground. Mm. We got the locations. Real estate company foundation mm. went by one day. This one woman who used to drive by there, she was so excited. She went to the foundation and got funding for us for the playground. Wow. So people mm -hmm. just kind of stepping up and mm -hmm. you know helping out, and it's kind of cool. We're having a community day on the 25th of February. If you want to come oh, in, wow. so okay. we're going to do planting and painting our gates and, and build the playground. So, small one, but we have a vision for two more. So, And this housing is specifically for agriculture workers. Agriculture workers. workers. Agriculture workers. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, and it's rental forever. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If you sell, like they did in many of the other plantations, right. or sell them to their that, which is nice and everything, but then it's no longer agriculture worker housing. Yeah. Okay. And this area is a big area of ag, and yeah. it makes sense mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. its own agriculture worker housing rentals forever. So mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. And so this is a big deal because we hear about this um, every year at the legislature where they're trying to allow. Uh, Farmers farm worker housing yeah. on ag land, but yeah. we know the problems that that has created yeah. where you get these ag McMansions mm -hmm. basically <laughs> pretending that they're doing agriculture by putting up a couple of fruit trees, <laughs> but you guys are really kind of addressing both sides of the issue where you're providing something affordable um, for the, the farm workers, mm -hmm. um, but then also ensuring that it stays with people who are in the ag industry. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the county's been just so great with us for this, you know, because there's lots of rules and all yeah. the rest of it, but they've come forward. We have not rezoned. We're still Ag 1, mm -hmm. and they're allowing all this rule breaking, essentially, giving us variances and the rest of it, because they know we're doing it in Ag, and mm -hmm. we're not going to create gentlemen's estates. So they have just really, really been helping us out on this issue. And has it been all positive feedback on that? Is anyone fighting you guys on that, or it's been? Very no, supportive. It's quiet. We try to keep quiet under the radar. <laughs> it's going to blow up now that you're the show. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, we've been under the radar, and people would, I mean, media came before when we were talking about this. Uh -huh. I mean, it's taken us eight years mm -hmm. to oh, get okay. the funding together and the rest of it. Oh, what are you doing? And then we're not going to talk to you get the first spade in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So we got the spade in the ground, it'll be done in May. So we're really kind of And do you already that. have farm workers that have applied? or? Well, we had some that were there already. Right. And okay. that's been a nightmare because, you know. Oh, before? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they have the, their house needs to be fixed. Right. So they, so some of them we kept empty because we knew this was happening. Mm -hmm. So they fixed up the empty ones, the new people, the people that have been there, moving to that. But gee, they want their old house. Sorry, you can't stay in your old house right. because you have to move you to this and we can't move you back. 
So there's been some logistic nightmares that, but everybody's been very patient and worked through there, and we're still having some of those upsets, but we're getting through this. Cool. That's great. So I, we have a few more minutes. I always like to kind of like to wrap this up with just kind of like what is the future for you guys for Hark, but also just the I mean as the local ag scene is transitioning even more. What do you see happening next, and what is um, both your individual roles, but also Hark's role in continuing to strengthen the agriculture sector? <laughs> Jamie, why don't you start? Um, that's a that's a challenging question. Um, I guess what I, I know. <laughs> I feel like I'm we taking a test right now. Here, Jamie. <laughs> I guess what my my focus, and I'm not sure if I'm properly answering your question, but my focus is just have um, has been to just find the things that. Um, can have the greatest impact, the things that everybody has in common, and focus on those things and work as hard as I can on those things to make ag work for everybody. So an example of that um, is something I've been talking about with a group of people recently where we want to do an equipment share program. Oh, wow. They do these things. It's not a new idea. They do these things on the mainland, and usually it's run through like a soil and water conservation district, and they purchase tractors or, you know, implements, things that farmers need, but um, they might not have the capital to use. Uh, or I mean, to, excuse me, to purchase. And so they, they buy them and people are able to rent them out and lease them out. And so I see that being something that's really useful for small farmers in Hawaii, especially because the average size of a farm is like five acres. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, sometimes you don't have $50,000 to go buy these giant pieces of equipment. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are the types of things that I'm really trying to focus on to help Hawaii Ag move forward. And I see the future of it being um, people coming around those kinds of things, the positive yeah. things, and really trying to work really hard to make them happen. Yeah. So we're glad to have Jamie because she's always positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Optimistic. What, you're not, you're not always positive? No. <laughs> she's been doing, doing it longer than me. But no, the vision is there and we plan to be successful in the next century. That's kind of our tagline now. We have oh, a big wow. sign up in our organization that, you know, some big banner up there, you know, success for the next century. So we were around for the first century of this, we're going to be around for the next century. So we'll just do what we have to do to keep it moving. And, and it's not going to be easy, it's tough. And some people, you know, there's, there's so much polarization going on now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the problem. We need to, what's a common interest? Jamie's really good about that. Mm -hmm. What's the common interest we can gather around rather than everybody pointing fingers and saying this is no good, that's no good. It's just, you know, we're small now and we've got to be better organized. Everybody. And we got to work together. And mm -hmm. it's really hard when you start seeing the polarization that's going on. So that's all. That's my negative yeah. part. Great. Awesome. <laughs> well, nice to wrap it up on that. We are yeah. out of time. Oh. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Okay. And we'll get an update from you later. <laughs> Sounds good. You're welcome. Thank you. Another 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you. All right.